Thank you, witnesses, for being here today. Um, in the last hour, we heard a little bit about transparency from one of the big grocers. And Mr. McCann, I, I'm going to ask this question to you. Um, we heard them talk about a, lo uh, a lot of transparency issues or lack thereof. So I'm just wondering if you can uh, elaborate for the committee. Um, it is Canada as transparent as other countries, say, uh, our neighbours to the U.S. when it comes to the value chain and supply chains in the food and agriculture industry? As is often the case, um, there's a lot that we don't know in Canada or, or information that we're missing that's available in the United States or other markets around the world. And I think if you look at the debate uh, over the last couple of years around this issue in particular, it's highlighted how much room for interpretation there is, how much disagreement over the facts there is, and how much need there is for a more rigorous, more compelling, more objective set of analysis around what is actually happening uh, with the cost of food. And this isn't just a retail issue. This is an issue all along the value chain where we don't have the same level of information and understanding as is available in, in the United States or some other markets. We know, for example, that in Canada, the top five uh, Grocery chains have about the same market share as the top 20 in the United States. But once you get beyond that high-level conclusion, it's hard to really understand what might be happening underneath it. So there's clearly significant room to increase the amount of transparency and, and information available today. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to turn now to um, Ms. Robinson or Mr. Ross, perhaps. Um, we've heard, I've heard from a lot of growers in the produce industry that uh, when they're dealing with big grocery chains, that they're subjected to a number of either fees uh, or, or, or different things. So one, I've heard they're subjected to un uh, unloading fees for the privilege of being able to deliver their goods to the centralized distribution warehouse for a grocer. They're charged a fee to unload their trucks there. Uh, I've also heard that if um, a truck arrives, let's say, 10 minutes late for their appointment time, that they're then charged a fine for being late. Yet if the grocer doesn't get to unloading the truck and makes the truck sit in the yard for 12 hours, they'll still make them pay a fee for that. We've also heard um, farmers being charged a fine if their truck is speeding one kilometer over the speed limit in in the distribution center's uh, yard at some point. We've heard of rejection fees. So if a load is rejected by the, the person who processes the load at the distribution center, then the farmer who, let's, let's be clear, like no farmer is going to want to send a perishable product that is not of great quality to go on a grocery store shelf on a truck to a distribution center to then get rejected, have it go back to their farm and have to repay the transportation costs to get it back there. So they're also being charged rejection fees if they reject a load. Um, so on top of rebates or rejection um, chargebacks to, to the farmers who pay the privilege of having a vendor number and keeping that vendor number with the grocery store chain. So I'm just wondering, have you heard these things happening from our growers in Canada? And maybe this this all is going to go into what we've talked about and what I've talked about since the fall of 2020 is we need a grocery code of conduct in this country to actually protect our growers, to keep our far family farms in business because I'm scared of what the future is going to look like in 15 years from now if we don't have family farms producing great quality uh, produce here in this country. So I'm just wondering if you can comment on any of that. The short answer is yes. The longer answer, uh, I don't know, Scott, do you want sure. to? Yeah. yeah, I think in many respects, all the different sort of fees you laid out, we've heard anecdotal evidence from growers across this country that in one instance or another, they are occurring. I certainly, uh, one of the concerns, I think, that, you know, to your question around transparency, uh, there is not a sense amongst farmers that they have an understanding of how fees are calculated and how they're being levied against them. And it's something we certainly look at, you know, a code of conduct as a measure to improve transparency in the supply chain. Because uh, I can attest to the fact that one of the frustrations we hear time and again is farmers don't understand what is behind the calculations that are being uh, levied against them in deductions and that there's not necessarily itemized uh, lines of what those uh, deductions even are in the first place. So there's a fundamental lack of transparency uh, that we hear time and again from farmers. So uh, if we were to go down the road, which we are, of a grocery code of conduct, how is that going to help benefit farmers? And, and one thing I'd just like to point out, to my knowledge, there is not another country 
on this planet, whether it's the U.S., the U Europe, some of our biggest trading partners, Mexico, that actually impose these kind of fees on farmers uh, at the grocery store level when they're delivering products uh, to them. So when when the general public is looking at this, uh, I can say, you know, it's practices like this. If no other industry also has any of this type of practice other than Canada, specifically in the grocery industry, then uh, as an outsider, it would seem that they're looking, uh, all they see is big, greedy grocery giants who are lining their pockets with record profits on the backs of Canadian farm families and our produce growers. And all they want to do is feed Canadians in the world. Yeah, so when it comes to the code of conduct, obviously it's a, still a work in progress. And as, as you know, some of the, the ongoing discussions uh, uh, relating to that are still confidential in nature. But I will say, uh, undeniably, transparency is one of the core tenets of what we're trying to pursue there. And the idea, very much so, is to get everyone on the same page around what is an acceptable practice in the industry when it comes to fair dealing across the supply chain. And I think in doing so, one of the critical elements of that is, and, and I've seen this firsthand in the development of the code, is a building of trust across the supply chain. And, and without that trust, I think a code of conduct can't actually function. And so really, um, as a first starting point, I will say it's an iterative process, a code of conduct. It's not something that overnight fixes all of the problems in the supply chain. <clears throat> but it builds a framework around which we can start driving towards improved transparency, improved con improve con contractual certainty, and really instilling principles of fair dealings and a common understanding of what that means in specific terms across the entire industry. And that really, from my perspective, is the value a code of conduct brings to this discussion. Thank, Thank you, you